Hey everyone, my name is Rich Jones and I'm the host of the Paychecks and Balances podcast. And today I'm joined by the founder of the Couple Money podcast and blog, El Martinez. Hey. Success coach and marketing consultant, Letitia Stiles. Hey, hey, hey. And the founder of creditwriter.com and Her Credit Matters, Michelle Black. Hi there. And we're here today to talk negotiation and knowing your worth. So let's get right into it with the first question. And Letitia, we're going to go to you. How has the way you set pricing or negotiate it changed from when you started to now? Yeah, this is a great question. And I love it because as a coach, you truly can choose your own pricing. It's a business that you really just, you know, you just pick a price, right? And so the way that I've chosen pricing and how it's changed over the years is that I first chose it based on what I thought people would be willing to pay. I did it based on selling from my potential client's pocket, so to speak. And these days I price and I teach my clients to price based on the value that you're bringing, the transformation that you're providing and how you're actually helping your clients to change their lives. So it, it has it has changed a lot over the years. And when you first started out, I'm assuming you got some of that people saying, well, I only got this and there's probably some feeling on your side of, eh, you know, I don't want to charge too much. So how did you kind of overcome that, that feeling that yeah. a lot of us have? Yeah, um, I, I realized that, that when people say like, oh, it's too much. I, what I learned was that I really just didn't know how to communicate the value. I didn't know how to actually explain the true transformation, like what is actually changing in their life. And so when I was first starting out, when I heard, oh, that's too much, or I don't know if I can do that, or it's a lot, I, I actually believe them. And now I realize that, you know, there's a percentage of people, yeah, who really, you know, are not able to, to step up and make that investment. But for the most part, if I hear, wow, that's more than I was expecting, well, that means that I didn't help set the expectation of this is what's actually going to change in your life. Got it. And Michelle, how about you? So I kind of first started out as a freelance writer by accident. Um, I had some fellow entrepreneur friends who um, knew I wrote well for a former business that I owned and they approached me to write for them. So my rates started out fairly low at like 20, 25 cents a word. And I just kind of accepted what was offered when I decided I wanted to transition into this full time. I set out to um, look up and kind of follow the example of some other successful freelance writers and see what they charged and what, you know, what the market value of what I had to offer was. Um, and, and that's how I kind of slowly began to bump up my prices to, to what they are now. So how would you recommend people even go about checking in with others who are in the same lane to kind of get a sense of what they are charging? Because that could be an awkward conversation. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't, you know, just go up to people and, Hey, what are your rates? That's a little off-putting. Um, I connected with people at FinCon and at CardCon, first of all. And then even online, I didn't focus on trying to poach their rates or, or anything like that, but um, just learn from these people that I respected and were well, well respected within um, kind of what I do within fr the freelance writing world um, and happened to stumble across, across a group of people who were very happy and willing to share um, kind of, you know, our time, everybody's time is limited as an entrepreneur. And so, um, you know, what am I willing to exchange something else that I'd rather be doing in my business or with my family for like what rate dictates that value to me? I love that. And L, what's your scoop? What's your story? Well, my business kind of, you know, like many of us has multiple sources. So I'm going to kind of go at two different angles originally like getting podcast sponsors versus also uh, with affiliate partnerships for my audience, I would get that pushback sometimes with price. And originally when I approached it, I would be, well, what business expenses do I have? And I ha had given myself an hourly rate that I felt was reasonable. And when I first started, it was matching the operations management job I had. So I was using that as a basis because I wanted to make that transition. But like Letitia had pointed out, 
I, I now start negotiating out of value um, when we're talking about podcast sponsorships to have someone sign up with a sponsor, you know, what value does that give, um, give the client? And for example, for the podcast, I had a couple money. The main sponsor right now is a, a regional credit union, coastal credit union. And so to have a, a new member would be great value to them. So I priced accordingly with that. And then on the other side, when you're selling to your community, you know, of course, you know, a whole discussion about finding the right partners because you want to add value is again, what am, what do they get at the end of this course? And and many times it's saving a significant amount of money that they can use for a goal that they really love that can give them some kind of financial freedom or some options. And so, I had to change my mindset, and it was definitely difficult. I mean, I can tell you in my masterminds, I I even pushed back when they're like, you know, you should charge X or you should approach the sponsor with this. I would say, I, I, I don't think, so. and they're like, what's the value that you're giving them? And then realizing that, yes, I am, I'm careful with who I partner up with. I am offering value and accepting that. That was a huge shift for me, but it made things so much easier now as a business. It's, uh, I work less hours and I feel like I'm enjoying the process more. Now, what's interesting, you're dealing with individuals or consumers and also with companies. So how does your approach change depending on which audience you're approaching? And then Letitia, I'm going to come to you with that one as well, because I think you're doing similar. Yeah. So, you know, you have to know your audience. I have to survey. You constantly have to check in with the community, whether it's through your Facebook group. Of course, the email list is the backbone that you have. And that let me know that sometimes you start off a business and uh, and maybe this was the case for many of us in the FinCon space where we were in debt, right? And then, you know, we started this business on the side and we have this mentality that they're at the point where we were and that's not necessarily the story. Um, my current audience make a, a good amount of income, but sometimes they're living in high cost of living areas or they just aren't communicating about money. And so when you're checking in your community, now you're seeing the reality versus what you think your audience can or can't do. Let them kind of bring up, this is the situation we're in. That way you can see where's the value that I'm bringing and you become more comfortable with a pricing model that satisfies you as a business and them as you know a, a, a part of the community. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off of that, where you were like, let them decide, that's essentially how I um, do my pricing tiers. So I do have high ticket coaching programs, but then for those who feel like I, I want to work with you, but I'm not quite ready to invest at that level, that's where my uh, courses come in and also free content. There's a lot of free content that I provide on YouTube in the topics. I mean, I almost you know, give away an entire course just on YouTube to help people no matter where they are. And then I do have the courses that are kind of like that next tier, which is, you know, it's an, it's an investment, but it's like a step up investment. And then obviously the high ticket coaching for, for those who are ready for that. Um, I do offer some done for you services. And so the pricing for that is gonna be a little bit different because that's the type of person who has more money than time. And so they're interested in let's just get it done and get it done quickly. And I'm interested to have you do it. So the pricing for that is gonna be different versus someone who has more time than money right now. Got it. And Michelle, how about you in your world? Um, so, you know, I directly work with, with businesses, not with consumers so much though. I do like to provide a lot of um, consumer content just because um, that's my background. I have 18 years of talking about and talking and mainly writing about credit and money. So um, I do put a lot of free content out there just because it's in my brain. It's got to get out anyway. Um, but kind of piggybacking on what Letitia and Elbo said, um, I try to focus on bringing a really valuable product to the businesses that I write for um, on a freelance basis. I want to turn in um, pieces that are totally compliant, that they don't require a lot of editing, that they hit every single thing that the client is trying to convey to their customers and to the customers that they're trying to attract so that, you know, they can just post it and start getting value for their business 
from the product that I provide. And, you know, hopefully that sets me apart from any other competition. And I just love to build long-term relationships with a handful of good clients um, so that I don't have to constantly go out there and search for new business. Um, I can just maybe occasionally add someone new here and there, but really develop these nice long-term working relationships with the businesses I partner with. And one thing I've heard a lot about in the freelance world, especially when you're getting started is, oh, get the byline. The company may pay you $10 or they'll pay you nothing because it's a notable publication. So what are your quick, and I, I might've opened up a can, but what are the quick thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that's the writing for exposure, which is uh, kind of a pet peeve of mine. You can die from exposure. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's good to have, you know, some bylines out there. I won't totally dismiss that concept. However, you know, your time is valuable. And if you're providing a valuable service to a company, I, I prefer to partner with people that I feel like value what I'm bringing to the table as well. And, um, you know, I've done a few of those over the years, but none of those are clients that I still work with and that I have kept these long-term relationships with. Um, so it's, it's not something I recommend for very long at all, maybe at the beginning, just to get your name out there a little bit. Got it. And Letitia, unconventional negotiating advice that you've received and or would offer and why is it important to you? Um, so besides the stare down, the other things that you can do are, uh, no. Uh, so when I first uh, started negotiating, it honestly was with my personal finance blog and I was working with sponsors and I was accepting just anything. And then I learned that if I just asked a simple question that I could increase the you know amount that I was receiving. And that simple question was, um, is there any wiggle room? Like, it's just, if they give you a number, like, is there any wiggle room? It's a quick yes or no answer. If they say no, you can decide what you wanna do with that. But if they say yes, like, oh, well, what were you thinking? Then you have the opportunity to open up a conversation. So that's, that's I've taken that with me as far as, you know, jobs, even in the past, like using that. I didn't negotiate my very first job, which I'm a little disappointed but I didn't learn, I, you know, hadn't not come you. to FinCon not enough you. times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now I'm good because I just negotiate with myself and I'm like, okay, let's put me on this payroll. Like how much do I want to pay myself? And I ask myself, is there any more wiggle room, Letitia? And I'm like, well, you know, I guess so. So <laughs> I love <laughs> that. <good> now. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely going to be adding that to my toolkit of things because I don't yeah. normally ask that wiggle room question. So that's a good mm -hmm. one. So L, how about you? Um, wow. Well, first of all, I, I think we've all heard the advice of, you know, of course we want to over deliver to your, your clients, you know, uh, make sure that they get that value. Uh, but the advice that I heard was you define the terms of what you're over delivering. It's not the client saying, well, can you give us this, that, and, you know, X, Y, and Z. It is talk with them. And, and this is another piece of advice. Try to kind of get a diagnosis. Like what is their main problem? What are they trying to, to get value um, out of you out of the community what can you give them and then you can deliver something that fits your schedule you know I think we've all done this at least once where because we care about you know keeping a good client we, we think we're going to over deliver and we give something that's like too much than our schedule allows or it's just you almost feel burnt out from it so talking with them, I could see like, you know what, there's more value I can provide here. And it's not that much time investment for me. Like, for example, a lot of clients always want the banner ad. And that's fine. You know, I'll include it in the package. But then I find out that on their site, they could use some content. Well, if you're sponsoring the podcast, I can take the show notes or I can take these key points create a, a, a post out of that and include that in the package um, and, you know, price accordingly. So I'm over delivering, but I'm doing it in my terms that I feel comfortable where it's not too much work on my part time-wise. Cause I, again, I want to move away from like the hourly charging and, you know, the numbers and, and what's the value or project-based pricing on that. Love it. And Michelle, going to go to you on this. And then uh, the last question, as we are rounding toward the end here, the parting words for the audience. So 
if you could uh, share the unconventional advice and then your parting words. All right. Um, unconventional advice. When I first transitioned from a part-time freelance writer to a full-time freelance writer, I gave myself a challenge to pitch 100 brands in 30 days. Um, and it wasn't that bad. It was five a day. I mean, the, the number sounds a little daunting, but through that exercise, um, one, I got used to being ignored or hearing the word no a lot. Um, but I didn't need a hundred new clients. I only needed, you know, eight to 10 good clients. And so it took the fear out of me requesting the rate, you know, that I thought I deserved based on the value that I was going to deliver. And also, you know, the rate that I knew I needed. Um, and so I would just say repetition, depending on what you're doing, if you're in a position where you can just make yourself do it over and over again, so that it takes the fear out of the process um, for you. And as far as parting words, um, I'd kind of piggyback on that as well. Just whatever you can do to take the fear or the self-doubt away, um, that imposter syndrome, whatever is whispering in your ear. Um, we all go through that, I think, or at least most of the entrepreneurs that I know go through that, doubt themselves. Um, so whatever exercises you can do to make yourself kind of get over that and get used to hearing no every once in a while and realizing that it's not the end of the world, that you may not be every person's cup of tea, but that's okay. You just need to find your businesses, your clients that you need to partner with and then serve them to the best of your ability. So basically get that, get that saboteur off your shoulder, get that off your shoulder. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So Tish coming to you. Yeah. The what parting words I would leave for you guys that are listening is um, don't put money on such a big pedestal. It, once you're detached from wanting it or needing it or having to have it, it does make negotiating a lot easier. It makes setting your rates a lot easier. It simply becomes, it kind of turns into a game. And then you think like, oh, uh, maybe I can charge this rate. And you figure out what the value is in that rate. And then you just put it out there. And like Michelle said, you know, you get enough conversations and there's someone who needs what you have to offer and they're going to see the value in what you have to offer and all you need to do is keep stacking up your nose until you get to that yes um, I learned that in a sales job where they said every no look at it as the next step to your yes and if you look at it that way then you know it becomes just a numbers game which is really all that it is and L how about you no pressure well after them uh, I'm going to address another fear because I think in particular with us in the FinCon group, a lot of us started out with this desire to serve and help others. And sometimes we might get into the mindset that I don't want to be a profit driven business, but I, I truly believe that you can be a profitable business and still be of service, be mission driven, be purpose driven and don't feel like because you're charging this much or you know what you may originally feel like this is too much but there's so much good do that you can do you can serve your community both you know on the site podcasts what whatever it is but then also outside um, i'm able to reduce my hours work wise so i can have more time to volunteer more time with my kids and family within the community um, and and so i think we need to maybe separate a fear or some money script that we have that if I'm trying to build a profitable business, it means it's profit first. And that's not the case at all. I love that. And that is a great place to wrap up. And we also don't have much of a choice. And I know this is something that, that, that we could talk about a lot further, but Michelle, Letitia, L, thank you so much for joining this conversation. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening and check out these folks and learn a lot more. Thank you. Thank you.